Let's talk about physics and wave motion. See, we need to get a good understanding of waves to truly understand how sonar works. And not waves like the surface waves you see on the ocean. Those are transverse waves. Transverse waves don't actually move the particles forward or backward, just up and down as the wave energy passes through the water. Sonar consists of longitudinal waves, which actually push the particles forward as the wave progresses. These are also known as sound waves or compressional waves because they are formed by compressing the water or air or whatever is in front of you. Pretty cool, huh? Now let's look at sonar. Sonar works by generating a sound wave into the water and then listening for its return. A lot of times we use the word transducer when talking about the wet end of a sonar. A transducer is just something that turns energy into something else. In our case, we turn electricity into sound waves by vibrating the materials in the transducer using what is known as the piezoelectric effect. The piezoelectric effect also explains why quartz crystals are used to provide precise timing in watches and clocks. If we built our transducer well, it will vibrate at a very precise frequency and create those sound waves we need by compressing the water in front of it over and over again really, really fast. But wait, what is frequency and why is it so important? Well, let's look back at our vibrating transducer. A transducer gets sent a pulse that makes it vibrate at a precise rate. Looking at the pulse, we see a waveform with peaks and valleys that repeat with a consistent amount of time between each one. That time is known as the period of the wave. The distance between peaks is known as the wavelength. If we take the inverse of the period, we get the frequency, or the number of peaks passing by per second. One peak per second would have a period of one second and a frequency of one hertz or one cycle per second. The wavelength in this situation would equal the speed of sound in water divided by the frequency. Now that we have built up a library of terms, let's talk about what we are actually trying to accomplish here. See, in order to operate a sonar and understand what is going on, you need to know a couple useful terms. Those include resolution, pulse length, pulse width, and ping rate. We'll cover all of these in the next few minutes. Let's start with pulses. When we talked about transducers turning energy into sound waves, we didn't talk about how much electricity you should use. See, if you leave the electricity on for a longer amount of time, you'll get a wider wave coming from the transducer. Our pulse length is the amount of time that we leave the sonar on to generate that wave. Pulse width is just what it sounds like, the width of the wave generated. Pulse length and pulse width are related through the speed of sound. Two pulses of equal length would have different widths in fresh and salt water, as the speed of sound is different between the two mediums. On to pings. A sonar ping is basically the same thing as a pulse. It's just a sonar term we like to use for sonar pulses. It also makes you think of that classic movie sound effect. Pings and pulses both describe a single output pulse from a sonar. Ping rate is basically the number of pings per second that you are generating. Okay, let's tie it all together and talk about resolution and recommended settings. I left resolution for the end because it's kind of hard to define. When people talk about resolution, they usually say something like, do this and you get better resolution, or we really want good resolution in this area. But what is resolution really? Resolution is the ability of the sonar to detect and separate two different objects. You can talk about range resolution, or the ability to see targets along the path of the wave, and angular resolution, or the ability to see targets along the path of your swath. So, how do you get good range and angular resolution? Range resolution depends on pulse width and frequency. If you are trying to detect the individual parts of a sunken ship, and they both fit inside one pulse, you're only going to see one big blob. Check out this animation of a radar system trying to detect two planes. It succeeds as long as the pulse width is short enough to not overwrite the second return. If you have more pulses or a higher frequency, you might detect more of what you are trying to find. Remember, pulse width depends on pulse length and speed of sound. Change your pulse length and you'll change your range resolution. Angular resolution is a bit trickier. 
It has more to do with the characteristics of the sonar itself and things like beam width and spreading that I'll cover in another video. What I can say is the deeper it is, the worse your angular resolution is going to be. So how is all of this practical, you might be saying? Well, now we can put together some guidelines on getting good range resolution that includes all of the concepts we've talked about here. Increase your range resolution by lowering your pulse length. Lowering your pulse length will decrease the amount of energy you're putting into the water, limiting your effective range. High frequencies also limit your range, as the water is essentially heated from high frequency energy and you lose some of your potential range. I hope this helps clear some stuff up for some of you. If nothing else, you are now prepared to read some of the manuals and papers out there that use these terms. That is, if you are the kind of person who's into that sort of thing. Anyway, thanks for watching and good luck out there.